The forsaken places of history, ominous and mysterious. Yugoslavia, a socialist country, but not part of the Warsaw Pact. A multi-ethnic state that keeps its ethnic tensions in check. Yet, eventually, it ran out of money and brothers became enemies. A secret military airbase cut deep inside a mountain. The most expensive structure in Yugoslavia. When it came time to pay the bills in the 1980s, and that's what happened. A recreational resort for the Yugoslav People's Army, open to foreigners and their currency, became a target in the civil war. Kupari. That was the beginning of the war. Hatred. A legacy of the Ottoman Empire, where diverse religions coexisted peacefully. Then, horrific killings. A trauma that still is felt today. Moscow. Shooting at women and children is not a sign of courage. Places full of secret stories, in ruins and disturbing. No one could have foreseen such an ending. Painful memories. You know, I feel sorry for every victim. Josip Broz Tito, president of Yugoslavia, ruled since the end of World War II. He skillfully maneuvered his country between the East and the West. Socialism, yes, but dependence on Moscow, no. Where we really saw him uh, elevated to this superstar was after the war, where all Yugoslavs were looking for peace and stability, and he was the one who was able to offer it. Yugoslavia's independence was guaranteed by its People's Army, the fourth largest military force in Europe. Secret building projects are started to secure its strike capability. The biggest one is the aerodrome Zeljeva. I always looked at the sky whenever a plane flew over, in particular jet planes and thunder jets. Yes, I'm Hassan Imamovic, and I was a MiG pilot for many years. The USA supplies Yugoslavia with a fleet of Thunder jets, but these aircraft are already outdated in the 1960s. As replacement for them, Tito buys Soviet mix and orders the construction of a bomb-proof airbase. Outside, you can only see the start and landing runways. The actual airbase is deep inside the mountain of Plezhevitsa. The 73-year-old Hassan Imamovic knows every inch of these mountain caverns. He was one of the first pilots here. Our first squadron arrived on May the 27th, 1968, from the airport at Pleso. Every gallery, every plane has its own refueling system within the object and was able to take off at any time. Originally, the Soviet MiG-21 is designed as a supersonic interceptor. Their export version is more versatile. It can engage other planes and attack ground targets. Yugoslavia buys more than 100 MiG-21s. Only candidates who meet the most rigorous criteria can become pilots. The MiG-21 is the most challenging airplane in the world. You have to be in top physical shape. Those who didn't make the cut flew helicopters and transport planes. The MiG-21 flies in extreme ranges. Its maximum altitude is 21.3 kilometers, and for that, you needed a cosmonaut spacesuit. Construction work for the secret project started in 1957. Estimated costs back then, 6 billion US dollars. 
about 50 billion euros in today's money. Its completion was delayed for years. The cast rock in these mountains posed a real problem during construction and the structure of the mountain, which is shot through with caverns. Today, the forests have reclaimed the pride of Yugoslavia. You can only see the runways. There are five of them, between 2,000 and 2,800 meters long each. At their ends, the three access points to the actual base. The solid steel doors weigh 100 tons each. There are three big caves inside the mountain, space enough for three fighter jet squadrons. There are also supply rooms, commando centers, training and sleeping facilities, and a mess hall. A total of 3.5 kilometers of tunnel are blasted out of the mountain. This is more than just another prestige project for President Tito. Yugoslavia needs to be prepared for two possible war scenarios. The enemy could attack from the east or the west. The airbase is located at the strategically optimal site for Yugoslavia. From here, it was possible to engage both NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Not many people can remember how things were back then. In the 70s, everything was completely different from today. It was the time of the Cold War, the days of Soviets and NATO, of nuclear weapons tests, of the nuclear threat. In my opinion, the construction of such an object showed the others that we were willing to fight. August 1968. After 11 years of construction, Zeljava is still not finished yet. Suddenly, an order is issued. The base has to be made operational immediately. The reason for this could be found only 800 kilometers to the north. In Prague, 2,000 Warsaw Pact tanks backed up by 250,000 soldiers invaded Czechoslovakia. Yugoslavia's ruler Tito is afraid that the troops' mission was to first take over Prague and then Belgrade. The high command was of the opinion that an invasion was imminent. They just didn't know the exact day. So everything was sped up to get the airbase operational. Because, of course, they were expecting them to attack us as well. The bunker airbase Zeljava is declared finished by executive order. Sure, things would not have turned out the way they did in Czechoslovakia, but the crisis there made sure that everything here was completed quickly. The interesting fact is that in spite of the political situation being so difficult, the Russians deliver the MiGs on schedule, not even a day late. Hassan Imamovic retired in 1986, six years before Zeljava is destroyed. Croatia, the Adriatic coast, a cultural landscape going back thousands of years. In the 1920s, a luxury hotel is built near the city of Dubrovnik, the Grand Hotel Kupari. To this day, its ruins have been witness to the magic that attracts vacationers from all over the world. My name is Ante Marstraba. I worked at this holiday resort from 1975 to 1991. Today, all that's left of the Grand Hotel is rubble, a memorial to an era in the Balkans when the dream of a multi-ethnic people living together in peace is kept alive by an iron fist. This is the most beautiful part of the hotel. Well, it used to be back then when it was still open. Now trees are growing on its roof. Yugoslavia is founded after World War I. Up to this point, the peoples of the land had been living under various rulers. Austria-Hungary, Serbia and the Ottoman Empire. 
1918, Yugoslavia was founded on the strengths of the southern Slavic languages being so closely related. This of ethnic linguistic proximity became a factor back then because it meant common ground for the future. Slovenians, Croats, Bosnian Muslims, Serbs, Montenegrins and Macedonians all belong to the southern Slavs. Plus, there are large communities of Hungarian and Albanian minorities that also live in the country. Yugoslavia itself is divided into six constituent republics, which don't always correspond to the ethnic groups living there. And that should prove to be a fatal fact in the course of history. After World War II, President Tito turns Yugoslavia into a socialist country, which, however, is allied neither with the Soviet Eastern Bloc nor the West. This wasn't a Democrat. Tito was a communist. He wanted to get rid, marginalize, and have control. The Yugoslav People's Army that Tito built is meant to guarantee Yugoslavia's independence. Its officers belong to society's upper crust and enjoy many privileges. Kupari, the luxury resort on the Adriatic coast, is converted into a military resort. The guests were mostly military, officers and their families. Later, they relaxed this rule a bit and allowed foreigners, like Russians or the French, to come here. Yugoslavia in the 70s is an open country and more affordable than Italy or France. And so, more and more tourists flock from the West. Three million in 1965, but in 1970, it's five million already, and 10 million in 1980. Including the campers, we had up to 8,000 guests per day. That means that in 1987, we had 1.8 million overnight stays by mid-September. There was no difference in how people were treated, if they were seven years old or 80. Revenues from tourism keep the rundown planned economy of Yugoslavia afloat. Yet the country spends more money than it can make. The government takes out loans in the east and the west. At the beginning of the 80s, the multi-ethnic country is deep in the red. In socialist Yugoslavia, this question was never asked, since you knew somebody else was going to pay the bills. And so we would never pay. Someone else would always pay. In this manner, 45 years of unpaid bills led to a disastrous ending. A really disastrous ending. The general director of the Grand Hotel leaves Yugoslavia and starts a new chapter at a hotel in Libya. And so Ante Mashtrapa is spared the eruption of violence in Kupari. Bosnia-Herzegovina, a constituent republic in the heart of Yugoslavia, with a rugged landscape and a grand history. In Mostar, opportunities and problems are thrown into particularly stark relief. The city center, cultural heritage of the Ottoman Empire, in the 1970s, socialist architecture was supposed to rejuvenate the city. Outside the old city of Mostar, a bank building is erected, designed by one of the most prominent architects in the country. When you start drawing, you come up with your first solution, then a second one, and so on. These two streets form an angle. A 10,000 square meter building was supposed to go up there. It was meant to be the financial center of Herzegovina. The bank administration would be headquartered here. My name is Dragan Djedic, born in 1949. I'm the architect who designed this building here in Mostar. Dragan Bidic's father, Jemal, fought against the German occupation together with Tito. After the war, he went into politics and rose to the position of minister-president. The Bidic family is Muslim. 
His father Jemal advocated for the recognition of the Bosnian Muslims as an official ethnic group in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is made up of six constituent republics. Bosnia and Herzegovina is considered a multi-ethnic community. The 1971 census broke the population down into 40% Muslim Bosnians, 37% Orthodox Serbs, and 22% Catholic Croats. That made Bosnia a miniature edition of Yugoslavia, a mix of ethnicities and religions, a powder keg. There had always been ethnic conflicts and tensions. There were wars and crimes, but also good times, collaboration and mutual understanding. Marriages between ethnic groups, in particular in Bosnia and Herzegovina, mostly in the cities. That was the foundation for multinational collaboration, closeness and mutual understanding. At that time, the population of Mostar is half Bosnian and half Croatian. The city is a model of peaceful coexistence. But Yugoslavia faces mounting economic problems, and that's reflected in the planning for the high-rise bank building. The oil price went up during the days of the first oil crisis. And then we used this thermal glazing for the windows to save energy. No need for air conditioning in the summer, since the exterior panes reflect the sunlight off, while in wintertime they absorb it. The bank is supposed to have an imposing ground floor, with one floor above for technical facilities and another six floors on top for offices. A building with exposed concrete, beton brut in French, from which the term brutalism is coined for this style. This brutalism in architecture is an expression of modernity, so typical of Yugoslavia back in the 1950s and 1960s. Starting back in the 1950s, socialist Yugoslavia had broken with socialism and its cultural concept of Stalinism and devoted itself totally to modernity. The technology inside the concrete block was modern as well. We planned this in a very modern way 40 years ago. Each of these holes was meant for one workplace. Cables, power, telephones and so on ran through here, so nothing would be lying around. In 1991 the cables have been installed and the building is finished. But then the war broke out and everything came to a halt, and that never changed, unfortunately. It is Mostar's tallest building. It offers you an unblocked vista of the inner city and the surrounding mountains. It is this 360-degree view that will turn Dragan's building into a place of terror. During the Civil War, Croat snipers chose this position to shoot at Bosnian civilians. You know, I feel sorry for every casualty. I honestly do. Of course I would have wanted the snipers to not have used this building, but then they would have used a different one. It's not a justification, but it's a tall building and made certain things possible for these bad people. Since then, Dragan has been working on a concept to complete this building. He has never again designed a building of this scale. Back to Kupari by the sea. Here, tourists from the west sunbathed on the beach alongside soldiers from the People's Army. Luxury vacation, Yugoslavian style. Today, this holiday resort is in ruins. The Yugoslav People's Army destroyed it. They also built it. My name is Ivana Kolic. The first time I came here was 1978, when I was nine. Ivana Kolic is a competitive swimmer from Dubrovnik near Kupari. There is no indoor swimming pool in her hometown. And so, in the winter, she traveled to Kupari for training. 
Oh, it's really sad to see it like this. I haven't been here since 1987. This was the entrance hall. There, the pool itself. Here, there was always a soldier on duty. This was his post and he watched everything from here. We weren't allowed to swim here whenever we wanted to. It was under military control. There's a story. Whenever the general wanted to have a swim, we had to get out of the pool and our training was over. The general preferred swimming alone. In 1984, the Olympic Winter Games are to be held in Sarajevo. Yugoslavia wants to present itself as modern and powerful. Many young athletes are chosen to carry the Olympic torch. Among them, Ivana Kolic, the swimmer from Dubrovnik. In Dubrovnik, four swimmers carried the Olympic torch. I was one of the four most successful athletes of the year, so I was asked to take part, even though I was only 14 and a half. What the world was not meant to see Yugoslavia was mired in an economic crisis. When it came time to pay the bills in the 1980s, and that's what happened, that was when the decline happened. So coincidental with Tito's death, you had Yugoslavia's debt coming due. Ivana, 14 years old back then, can feel how the supply situation is deteriorating. I remember empty shelves in stores, so no detergents, no chocolate. For a couple of years, we had no chocolate. The government's answer to these shortages? Slogans. The Young Pioneer Organization is tasked with educating the country's youth to become good comrades in the spirit of Tito. And that meant everybody should feel Yugoslavian, not as a Croat, a Serb or a Bosnian. I thought if you are born and live in Croatia, you were a Croat, and that we were defined by this administrative unit. And if you live in Serbia, you're a Serb. So I thought there can't be any minorities, especially not among people who speak the same language. Ethnic tensions are beginning to mount in the 1980s. Croatia and Slovenia are the richest constituent republics. Serbia wields the largest political influence. And the majority of high officers within the People's Army are Serbian. problem. <laughs> The problem, of course, became very clear. A new law was passed to fill the ranks of higher officers, colonels and generals proportionally to their numbers in the population. The army ignored this law. Of the 479 higher army positions, only 25% are filled with Croats or Bosnians. With their 75%, Serbs and Montenegrins have control of the army. The religious fault lines also run parallel to the ethnic ones. The intersection of those two leads into a catastrophe that can be felt until today. Today, the church plays a very important role in Croatia. There's a kind of Christian or better Catholic indoctrination happening, much worse than ever during communism. Ivana College left Kupari to go to law school. She only returned after the war. Today, the former competitive swimmer works as an attorney for labor law in Dubrovnik. The secret project Jeljava is considered the key to Yugoslavia's border security. 
The facility in the mountain of Plezhevitsa is reinforced with concrete to withstand even nuclear attacks. The MiG fighters stationed here can be made battle ready within a few minutes. They are meant to deter any attacks from the east and the west. However, the facility proves useless against attacks from within during a civil war. After so much work and so many sacrifices from all those people of the former Yugoslavia and so much GDP that went into this project, now everything is in ruins. Nothing lasts forever. Zenko Jancic. I came to the airbase for the first time in August of 1981. During the Cold War, the Zeljava Air Base is one of a kind. More than 1,000 soldiers and their planes here are well protected against possible enemy attacks. An underground fortress built to safeguard Yugoslavia's air sovereignty. But there are not only fighter planes in Zeljava. Yugoslavia's aerial reconnaissance is also coordinated from here. This was the aerial photography section. Here is where they took pictures of the entire border and the neighboring territories. Any kind of change that might be of military or economic importance could be looked at in high-resolution photos. Spying, shooting missiles down and bombing targets. Zeljava is versatile in strategic military matters. But the airbase has a political purpose too. It is meant to impress. I think Yugoslavia profited from this facility here. We were not only on a par with Europe, but also with Russia. Not that we would have been able to win against Russia with this, but it gave us the leverage to get better deals for our country. Zdenko Jancic works his way up to the top of the airbase leadership. However, even for Deputy Commander Zdenko Jancic, there is a section in Zeljava that he has no access to, the listening post of the intelligence service. What was planned for spying on foreign countries is now also used to eavesdrop on its own army in the early 90s. The Serbian Montenegrin majority officers are listening in on the minorities. Here, maybe these connectors tell you more about what the purpose of all this was. All the telephone calls were recorded and patched through here. The problem was that this was highly controversial in the final years of this object. It didn't fulfill its original mission anymore, but was used for nationalism. Zeljava is situated in the Krajina region, and thus not only at the border between the constituent republics Croatia and Bosnia, but also in an enclave with a Serbian ethnic majority. A situation that is fraught with danger. The Serbs in Krajina are afraid of Croatia seceding from Yugoslavia. That would make them a minority in a Croatian state. The Yugoslav People's Army, with its Serbian Majority Officers Corps, supports the nationalists in Krajina. Zdenko Jancic discovers that weapons and ammunition are disappearing from Zeljava and resurfacing later in the hands of Krajina militias. When I saw what the Yugoslav People's Army was doing here, it was mostly the Serbs. I decided to quit the military. On June the 25th, 1991, 
the constituent republics of Slovenia and Croatia declared their independence. For Zdenko Jancec, the time has come to free Zeljava. With Croatia's independence, Zeljava suddenly lies in enemy territory for the Air Force's Serbian Montenegrin majority. To prevent the base from falling into enemy hands, they resort to a drastic step. The single biggest investment in Yugoslavia's history now lies shattered and in ruins. I can't tell you when. Probably at the beginning of 1992, it became clear that you couldn't hold Croatia and Bosnia was also at risk. In the end, the mix still deployed here bombed all the runways. To this day, you can see the craters from the air. Zdenko Jancic never returned to Zeljava since then, until today. The civil war also has a dramatic impact in Kupari. The luxury resort on the Adriatic coast near Dubrovnik attracts tourists from all over the world. The special thing is the facility is under military control. Here, the crisis that pushes Yugoslavia to the brink of bankruptcy in the 1980s has gone almost unnoticed for a long time. An island of precarious serenity, while elsewhere Yugoslavia's catastrophe is picking up speed. Desert. I was 10 when I understood the beauty of Kupari for the first time. A laid-back paradise, a very simple life. For others, it was a holiday. For me, my home, my life. That was before the war. I'm Marko Perkusic, born on March 6, 1977, in Kupari. Marko Perkusic grew up at the military hotel in Kupari. His grandfather worked in the hotel management. In Kupari, soldiers from the Yugoslav People's Army met vacationers from the West. They're not too shy to mingle. However, the growing nationalism doesn't stop at young people. Back then, we wore T-shirts with Croatia's coat of arms on them. We were asked why we did that. But we asked back why they were wearing uniforms. It was just goofing around, teasing them. But that was only the beginning. Marco, 13 years old then, had no idea about the history of Croatia's coat of arms. During World War II, it is also the symbol of Croatian fascists. There is a danger of the old animosities between Croats and Serbs flaring up again. The prevailing conviction was that the others were responsible for the problems of Yugoslavia and that they receive preferential treatment at our expense. That was the basis for inter-ethnic conflicts and eventually for the wars at the beginning of the 90s. May the 13th, 1990. The top match in the Yugoslavian Soccer League. Dynamo Zagreb against Red Star Belgrade. For some of the fans of both sides, this also means Croats against Serbs. The game ends in violence. 60 people are injured. The beginning of the end of Yugoslavia. The people we had known since our childhood were suddenly carrying batons or knives. What are you doing with a knife, I asked. And he replied, I don't know, in case I'm attacked. That was the beginning of war and hatred. The central government is unwilling to simply accept Croatia's and Slovenia's declarations of independence. Serbian politicians and the military see themselves as the defenders of Yugoslavia's unity and attack Slovenia and Croatia. On Croatia's Adriatic coast, People's Army units are marching on Dubrovnik.
Kupari is the first to come under attack. On October the 1st, 1991, at 6.20 a.m., the first shells woke us. It changed our lives completely. For life in this region, and you as a person, the entire world changed for me. A war between neighbors and brothers. Guests flee. Grenades are fired at hotels. The Kupari military hotel is fired upon by army units. Chances are high that some of the attacking soldiers have spent their vacations here at some time. The people from Kupari flee into nearby Dubrovnik, where the war catches up with them. Without supplies or safe shelter, they watch their coast vanish into smoke. Marco spends a year as a refugee in Germany. After the end of the bloodbath, he returned to his home. The hotel facility where he grew up had been destroyed and ransacked long ago. March 1992, the Bosnian population votes on its independence. Even before the result is known, the Bosnian government is claiming that a majority has voted for independence. Western governments fear the fragmentation of Bosnia could throw the Republic into a civil war worse than that which killed thousands in Croatia. Fears that come true. None of my family or friends were killed. Whenever I pass these places of terror, I simply can't forget any of it. It still hurts to this day. My name is Dojan Kacic, and I'm a set builder at the Mostar Theatre. In 1993, I was the victim of a sniper. The night of the ballot count, a majority of Bosnians vote in favor of independence. But the result is deceptive. What looks like a clear majority favoring secession spells the end of peaceful coexistence. 1.2 million Serbs boycotted the referendum. This third of the population now wants to unite with what's left of Yugoslavia. Mostar takes only little notice of these developments. The population in the south of Bosnia is almost exclusively Muslim Bosnians and Catholic Croats. Before the war, life was great. Mostar was a city with 70% to 80% mixed marriages. In those days, nobody gave any thought about who was what. Most people had a job. They were doing fine. Serbian's ruler Slobodan Milosevic is the driving force behind the country's civil war. The leadership of the Yugoslav army is dominated by Serbs, and they follow the new strongman. Now the Serbian leadership wants to conquer Bosnia and cleanse it ethnically. And so the first act of the Bosnian drama begins, the attack on Mostar. The facade was all glass and shattered to pieces in the Serbian attack. The fight for Mostar lasts for two months. In June of 1992, Croatian units forced the Serbian troops to retreat. Many buildings are heavily damaged. Among them, the high-rise bank building no one ever moved into. The Croats from Bosnia were in many ways seen as the most nationalist, the most extreme. And they often saw their capital as Zagreb and not Sarajevo. So what they wanted to do ultimately was to join with Croatia and have a Croatian state. Snipers became instruments of terror in the Yugoslav war. Anyone could be a target. Women, children, the elderly.
Their goal was to strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. I can't understand how you can be a sniper. There's war everywhere, man-to-man -man battle. That I understand. But to sit here, to eat and drink, and between two bites, shoot an old woman or a child dead, there's no courage in that. The Croatian army attacked Mostar from the west. The large part of the Bosnian population flees into the eastern part of Mostar across the Nevetva River. Residents with Croatian roots take flight into the opposite direction. The ruined bank building is the tallest one in Mostar on the Croatian side. It is from there that snipers put the Bosnian eastern part of Mostar into their crosshairs. Only one kilometer away as the crow flies, a residential neighborhood on a hill. In the fall of 1993, Stojan is walking uphill on a small road and is hit in the leg by a sniper's bullet. At that moment, I only felt some brief pain. It was only later at the hospital when they cut my pants open that I saw what was really going on. The bullet didn't give me too much pain. Maybe I didn't feel anything out of spite. I really didn't feel anything. The bullet went clean through. A big scar reminds Stoyan of the civil war every day. Estimates say more than 2,000 people were killed by sniper fire in the Bosnian war. After the civil war, many looked back at life in former Yugoslavia like it was some kind of a lost idyllic world. Above all, of course, those who had benefited from the system, politicians and officers. But many ordinary citizens also look back at Yugoslavia with nostalgia, where life may not have been prosperous, but peaceful at least. We lived a normal life. There were no tensions. Back then, we practiced the so-called brotherhood and unity. When you think about it later, if someone had told you a few months before what was going to happen, you would have told them they're nuts. I'm Daniel Borovic, a MiG-21 pilot. I was stationed at the Zeljava Air Base between 1982 and 92. What may well be the most unusual legacy of Yugoslavia lies deep inside a mountain. The military airfield you're born with it, what it takes to be a fighter pilot. Only a few people can do the job. In theory, only 0.5% of all people have what it takes to be a fighter pilot. Do you realize how few that is? Three MiG-21 squadrons are stationed in Zeljava. Two for air fights and one for reconnaissance with high-resolution cameras. Under attack, all the planes would have been fueled up in the tunnels. Unfortunately, the facility has been destroyed. It's stuck. We were prepared for war against a foreign enemy. But things didn't turn out quite like we expected. With the breakup of Yugoslavia, the army also begins to fall apart. Serbs and Montenegrins become allies against Croats and Bosnians. Most heavy weaponry remains in Serbian hands. Croatia tries to secure a MiG fighter jet and gets in touch with Croatian officers. 
This conversation was, of course, picked up by the listeners. Someone got direct orders to find somebody at the airfield who was willing to fly a plane across someday. Many Croats desert the army and defect to recently founded Croatia. Daniel stays behind. He's supposed to wait for an opportunity to bag a MiG-21. And so my family and I lived under emotional stress for months. We had to pretend everything was still normal, go to work, but in reality, you're waiting for something to happen. And you're outraged by current events. His superiors don't trust Daniel Borovic and put him on sick leave due to some alleged neurotic behavior. But the army was suffering from a shortage of fighter pilots. So in February 1992, he is allowed to fly again. He's tasked with training a new pilot for air-to-air -air combat. Borovic sees an opportunity. The situation was dramatic. That day, the weather was terrible. The two of us took off from runway number two. Our job was to intercept a fighter jet. After the interception maneuver, when an opportunity presented itself, I broke away from the other pilot and continued on my own. Daniel can get away and lands his plane in his new home. It is the first fighter plane of the newly established Croatian army. To this day, Borovic is celebrated as a hero in Croatia and is seen as a traitor in Serbia. The most famous bridge in Yugoslavia has spanned the Nevitba River since 1566. The name of this landmark, Stari Most, becomes the name of the city, Mostar. But the bridge divers are no less famous. From a height of 25 meters, they dive into water that runs only several meters deep. But the Bosnian city of Mostar has been under siege since June of 1993. The bridge divers are now soldiers. A young man's family sends him to safety in Germany. He returns on his own accord. I came back because I thought it would be over by now. And we could return and then simply pick up where we left off. I had no idea what war was really like. My name is Eldon Palata. I'm 46. During the war, I fought for Bosnia. I filmed the destruction of the bridge. Mostar becomes a symbol for the horrors of the Yugoslavian wars. The city is put under siege twice and twice becomes the victim of so-called ethnic cleansings. In 1991, the first Serbian fighters attacked the city. Then, half a year later, Croatian militia begin their fight against Bosnian forces. And once again, the death toll is high among the civilian population. Eldin, a Muslim Bosnian, promises himself to never want revenge, in spite of everything that has happened. To paint all Croats with one brush and say they all committed crimes? No, not all Croats have committed crimes. Eldin Palata owned a camera. Inside Mostar, he filmed scenes of the siege. And that's not an easy task. Power supply is intermittent and charging batteries difficult. And he has only one cassette tape, which he reuses over and over again. On November 9th, 1993, the Croatian army starts shelling the old bridge. In retaliation, the Croats targeted the Mostar bridge. The bridge is the city's landmark and a UNESCO World Heritage Site with no military significance whatsoever. It was shelled from the foot of Mount Hum. The place is called Stotina. Why did they destroy the bridge? I don't know. I'll never understand it. Eldin Palata films the incomprehensible. The 400-year-old bridge collapses.
After the bridge had collapsed, they started to celebrate on the Croatian side. That hurt the most. In 2004, a new bridge is opened. This new Stari Most has been designed using historical building plans to stay as true as possible to the original. The war in Bosnia ended with the Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995. However, the years of death and terror are not so easy to forget. Even the International Criminal Court in The Hague, established to prosecute war crimes in Yugoslavia, can only help so much. 24 years after the destruction of their city, it becomes obvious there won't be any justice for their suffering. To this day, Mostar and the whole of Bosnia have found little peace. The wounds of war just run too deep. I'm afraid of the time during election campaigns in Mostar. Not because I'm afraid Croats or Serbs are going to attack me. Nobody's going to attack me. But politicians will exploit every chance they get to say, you see, you simply cannot live together with them. They create an atmosphere where every group only votes for their own. Muslims for Muslims, Croats for Croats. But what's going to happen to the people? The old Yugoslavia was drowned in a bloodbath. Nationalists and fanatics brought death and misery to thousands and thousands. Ancient animosities boiled over yet again. But slowly peace returned and the peoples of the West Balkan were eventually able to become neighbors again. What remains are the traces of a lost world, the scars of a civil war, and the memory of 150,000 dead.